Yep, I'm ready to go. So it's time. Um, I'm very happy to see so many of you here today to listen to Professor Patakos' talk. Uh, this is going to be our sixth day short course on the Pashmi Dynamic Program. So before Professor Patakos starts the short course, let me briefly introduce him a little bit. So Dimitri Patakos studied mechanical and electrical engineering at the National Technical University of Athens in Greece and obtained his PhD in system science from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He has held faculty positions with the engineering economic system department in Stanford and then the electrical engineering department of the University of Illinois in Urbana. Since 1979, he has been teaching at the electrical engineering and the computer science department of the MIT. Well, he is currently a McAfee professor of engineering. His research spans several fields, including optimization, control, large-scale computation, and data communication networks, and is closely tied to the teaching and book authoring activities. He has written numerous research papers and 14, I should actually say 15 books right now several of which are used as textbooks in MIT classes. His involvement with dynamic programming started with his PhD thesis and has continued through the present with many research papers and several books and research monographs. Professor Botakis was awarded the Inform's 1997 prize for research excellence in the interface between operations research and computer science for his book, Neurodynamic Programming, co-authored with John Tzitzitz. He was awarded the 2000 Greek National Award for Operations Research, then the 2001 American Control Conference John R. Bergazzini Education Award, and the 2009 Infos Expository Writing Award. In 2001, he was elected to the United States the United States National Academy of Engineering for pioneering contributions to fundamental research, practice, and education of optimization, control theory, and especially its application to data communication networks. So we are very happy and honored to have Dimitri here to give us the short course on dynamic programming. Let's give him our big hands. Thank you very much, Samuel. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm concerned a little bit with sound. Can you hear me in the back now? OK. We're trying to get a microphone. Is this better? OK, good. <laughs> OK, so I'll try to do my best with the sound. And um, this is a six lecture course on approximate dynamic programming. It's a somewhat advanced course. It's a research-oriented course. The subject is right at the forefront of research, and it's a hot subject with many applications and interesting theory. Uh, there are many books now in, on, the, on the subject. However, my lectures are going to be based, not surprisingly, on my books. Uh, the first book is the Neurodynamic Programming book that I've written with John Tsitsiklis back in 1996. Um, it's a research monograph, really, uh, and many parts of it still remain relevant now. Uh, I have a textbook whose the latest edition was published two, two years ago, and this is more up to date, and it's also more accessible than the first book. And last year I wrote a research monograph called Abstract Dynamic Programming that has some relevance to the course material. Um, we are going to be posting the slides, my slides, in a website which will be announced. However, if you want to see a full set of slides on dynamic programming, in, including approximate dynamic programming, you may find it here. There are several sets of slides, the latest being one or two years ago. Okay. So, um, 
let uh, me give you a brief outline of what uh, we're going to be covering. OK, this is our subject, large-scale dynamic programming based on approximations and in part on simulation. A research area of great interest for the last 25 years, and it comes under various names. Reinforcement learning, that's the, that's the name that people in artificial intelligence or learning use, and neurodynamic programming or approximate dynamic programming that I have been using. Um, there have been two lines of research which at some point converged and in a very productive and fruitful way. One was from artificial intelligence, uh, the reinforcement learning line with its ideas on, on feature-based representations of uh, functions and relations and also the idea of uh, learning by observation or simulation. And the other side of the, the other line of research came from optimization control theory with its emphasis on formal optimization methods and algorithms such as policy iteration, value iteration, and so on. At some point, people that worked over here and people who worked over here realized that they were doing with the same problem, approaching from different sides, and the cross fertilization between them was very productive. Now, our subject deals with control of dynamic systems under uncertainty. The echo sound is too low, but you see if I can change it. OK, if you could. And then you can continue. <laughs> OK. Um, we are going to be discussing control of dynamic systems under stochastic uncertainty. But the material we're going to talk about has extensions, some of which I'm going to mention to cases where the uncertainty is not stochastic, it may be minimax type of uncertainty, set membership uncertainty, or, uh, or uncertainty produced by the actions of an antagonistic opponent, yeah, it's better. as in games, multi-stage games. But also it has, uh, it, because dynamic program is a very broadly applicable subject, it has applications way beyond the control of dynamic systems, such as, for example, solving discrete optimization problems, combinatorial optimization problems, integer programming. It's an excellent suboptimal method for solving such problems. Dynamic programming has always been recognized as having a very, very broad range of applications. Uh, it was that the algorithms were not sufficiently powerful to deal with the applications uh, the size of the applications. But now that we know how to deal with large scale problems, there's a vast horizon of applications in all kinds of fields, from control theory to operations research to economics to artificial intelligence, finance, and all kinds of fields. Dynamic programming is very general. And now that we are getting close to being able to realize its full potential, we have a big vista of potential payoff. Regarding the methodology of the subject, it's, um, it has a rich variety of theory and math. It also has an element of art in it. Because we are dealing with challenging problems, it's important to, under to, to approach them in a creative way. Um, there's also, there are also issues relating to um, more abstract theoretical uh, aspects of the subject. Uh, modeling issues, how do you model problems as dynamic programming problems. We don't have time to cover all this, so we will focus primarily on algorithms. OK, so here's what we will aim within the limited, uh, uh, the limited framework of six lectures. Uh, a state-of-the-art account of some of the major topics at a graduate level. Okay, this is fairly advanced. It's for graduate stu students primarily. Okay, it's uh, it's moreover it's fast. So if you could make an effort to study the, st the slides ahead of time, read a little bit, it would be good because we are going to be going somewhat fast. And our aim is to show how by approximation and simulation we can address the dual curses of dynamic programming. Now, Bellman, the originator of dynamic programming, coined the term curse of dimensionality, uh, meaning 
the difficulty of addressing large dimensional problems with the dynamic programming technique. He recognized this as a major limitation of dynamic programming. Well, we're going to try to address this curse of dynamic programming. There's another curse of dynamic programming. If you want to apply it in its exact form, you need an exact mathematical model of the system. You need equations for the system, transition probabilities, and so on. Some systems do not have an easily obtainable mathematical model. But instead, you can simulate them. There's a simulator, either a real-time simulator or computer simulator. And it turns out that we can deal with problems like that without a mathematical model. A computer simulator will suffice. And uh, that's part and parcel of the nature of the techniques we're going to discuss. Here's what we're going to cover. Two lectures, today and Wednesday, on exact dynamic programming, a review of finite horizon problems, but with an emphasis on infinite horizon problems, control of a dynamic system over an infinite number of stages. And uh, we are going to talk about algorithms and issues of large scale computation. With election on Friday, we're going to enter the approximation and simulation methodology. We're going to discuss general issues uh, for large scale problems. And then in the second week, we're going to discuss more specific approximate dynamic programming techniques. One lecture on approximate policy iteration based on methods called temporal differences, Galerkin approximation, various methods of this type. One lecture on aggregation methods in one lecture on Q-learning and other methods such as approximation policy space. So the first week is going to be preparation for the second week. That doesn't mean that the first week is going to be easy, OK? Just to warn you. Uh, but the main research content is going to come here in the second week. OK, so what are we going to do today? an introduction to dynamic programming and approximate dynamic programming. First, focus on finite horizon problems involving decisions in a finite number of steps. Okay, make a decision now, then make a decision tomorrow, then again, a finite number of decisions in sequence. We're going to discuss the dynamic programming algorithm for such finite horizon problems, the classical form of the algorithm. Then we're going to turn to infinite horizon problems and develop some of the basic theory for the easiest type of infinite horizon problem, which is discounted, discounted problems. Discounted problems with bounded cost per stage. OK, so let's get started. First of all, where does dynamic programming fit within the broad field of optimization? When I started doing research in this field, Optimization was really an exotic subject, you know, something that was at the edges of research. Now it has become very fundamental, all-encompassing, all-pervasive. You can find optimization elsewhere, everywhere, and, there's, and there's, there are so many different kinds of optimization that one wants to wonder, what are the connections between all these? At a more abstract level, there's only one optimization problem. What you see here, minimize a cost function of a variable u, u may be a scalar, a vector, or something even more complicated, it must live within a constraint set, capital U. And you want to minimize this cost function over all u that are admissible, are in this constraint set. Now, depending on the nature of g and u, you have different names. The big divide is between discrete problems, where u is a finite set or continuous problems where u is not finite and g has some continuity properties, such as differentiable, for example, and so on. Discrete problems are the combinatorial problems that computer scientists like to address. Uh, the integer programming problems. Uh, they have a different character than these continuous problems, which are usually solved by calculus type of methods or convexity type of methods. So that's one big divide, discrete and continuous. 
Another big divide is linear programming problems and nonlinear programming problems. Linear programming problems are the ones, linear and nonlinear are continuous. But in linear, G is linear and U is a polyhedral set. And nonlinear are the ones that are not linear. Linear are connected to discrete and industrial programming problems, but fundamentally they are continuous. So that's another categorization of, uh, of problems. Another major categorization of, the, of problems is be, to divide them between stochastic and deterministic. Now, stochastic problems involve a stochastic parameter, W, a random variable, which is averaged in some way by taking expectation. And G, the cost function, has this form here. So for a given U, I have a function capital G of U and some random variable W. I average this by taking the expected value over W. And for each U, I get a number here. Okay? And now I minimize this number over U. So stochastic problems are really the same as these, but they involve a stochastic element, which very much affects the type of methodology that you need to solve them. Now, dynamic programming in, can deal with stochastic problems as well as with deterministic problems, can deal with discrete, can deal with continuous, can deal with linear and nonlinear. But the main characteristic that distinguishes from all the others is that it is multi-stage. In other words, I select not just a U, but a U over each one of several stages. I select a U now, I select a U tomorrow, another U after two days, and so on. And each time, this W, this unknown random variable, reveals itself to us uh, in the form of some information. So multiple stages following receipt of new information. Okay? That's a characteristic of dynamic programming that's unique. The information about W is revealed in stages. The decisions are also made in stages. And they make use of the available information. In other words, we have to wait to get the information in order to make better decisions. So there's a feedback loop here between decision and information, which is characteristic to dynamic programming. For this reason, its methodology is different, kind of different. People say, ask me often, I have taken linear programming. Should I take dynamic programming? Is it different? Well, it's fundamentally different. It uses different methods, different structure, different mentality. Okay? It's, uh, it's nothing, very little, that uh, you see here in terms of methodology for these problems resembles what you see in dynamic programming. Another big difference is that dynamic programming focuses on global minima, okay? Global, op globally optimal solution. Some of these methods may get stuck into local minima. So, so if you've taken any one of these courses, expect to hear something different here today in, in, this, in this course. Okay, so if this is where it fits. And um, let me give you now a basic model that we are going to be using throughout this course. We have a discrete time dynamic system, a system that evolves over time. K indexes the discrete time, and K ranges from time 0 to time n plus minus 1 and terminates after xn is uh, generated. OK, what is this xk? xk is the state of the system. What is the state? Well, it's hard to describe it, but, uh, and it can be some very strange things. But its main property is it summarizes all the past information that's relevant for future optimization. In other words, this system evolves over time. If we look at its current state, in order to make future optimal decisions, that's all I need to know, just the current state in the data of the problem. I don't need to look at how the system came to this state. I don't need to look at the past. It's something that, mathematically speaking, it separates the past from the future from the purposes of optimization. 
UK is the control or decision. This is what we're interested in. We want to know how to make optimal decisions while observing the current state. WK is a random parameter, also can be viewed as a noise in some, some engineering systems, or we can call it a disturbance, depending on the context. And N is what we call the horizon, or the number of times control is applied. Later, we're going to talk about infinite horizon problems where N is infinity, okay? But let's focus first at the case of a finite horizon. Okay. So, we have a system, starts at X0, then control is applied, some random W occurs, and X1 occurs, then a new control is applied, U, W2 occurs, and U2 is applied, and then we go to X3, and so on. Uh, sequential application of control and sequential generation of states. Now, with every transition, with each K, there's a certain cost that occurs. At time k, the cost, gk is the cost that is incurred when we are at state xk, apply control uk, and also w occurs. So at time zero, there's a g0 cost that occurs, then a g1, then g2, and all of this is added up, and at the terminal state, there's another terminal cost, which we denote by this function here. These are scalar functions, real valued functions. These are numbers here. However, they are random numbers. Why random? Because no matter what, what, whatever u that you put here, w makes this number a random number. So the whole cost is random, even if you fix the u's, the controls. Therefore, in order to make this a meaningful criterion for optimization, you need to take expected value. The expected value here is with respect to all the random Ws. So if I apply some Us in here, then I get a number, and I can ask the question, what are the Us that make this cost minimum? That's our problem. Okay. Now, one way to describe dynamic systems is by an equation like this. There's an alternative way that, depending on the context, may be more convenient. And that is through a transition, through transition probabilities. This P here is a conditional probability that gives you, for the current value of X and the current value of U, the probability distribution of the next state. This is an alternative but equivalent description of a system. Because if I have a system like this, I can generate these transition probabilities from this equation, given the distribution of wk, I can get the distribution of xk plus 1. Alternatively, if I give you this, then you can define a system of this form in a very simple way. Consider this special equation, where xk plus 1 is just the w, and give us distribution of w to be the distribution of xk plus 1. This is not going to be so important in our course, but if you see in the literature a subject developed in terms of a model with transition probabilities, be aware that's equivalent. It can, all the results can be transformed into our format. Okay. Now, what I'd like to do is give you an example of a system like this, and then what we will do is develop the dynamic programming algorithm for this problem. This is an inventory control problem, a warehouse where you store things, and then customers come and you sell them, and then you have to order more to replenish, and so on. I'm sorry. Nobody ever calls me here. Okay. OK. 
Okay. <laughs> Okay, so this is an inventory system. Okay, XK is the, the stock at period K. So let's say if this is a, a system where we store cars, XK is the number of cars at time K. Now, at, uh, during this time period K, uh, customers come and they demand a certain WK quantity, which has to be subtracted from XK. At the same time, at this period, we order stock, we order new cars, UK, okay, that's UK, and therefore, the number of the stock at period K plus one evolves according to this equation. What we have, what additional we get, minus what we give away. XK plus one, it is an equation of the form that I gave you, a discrete time equation. At the same time, there's some cost to be paid for our ordering decisions. When I order UK, then I have to pay a certain amount. C is the price of that UK, okay, price per car that I pay. So I have to pay this cost, and there is also some additional cost. At the end of the period, when I look at the inventory, I want the inventory to be roughly zero, okay? Uh, I don't want to have excess inventory, or I have shortage of inventory. So there is some cost associated with having, having too much or too little at the end of the period. So that's a, a common formulation of the problem. Minimize over n time periods the total ordering costs plus the cost associated with having too much or too little inventory. And my discrete time system is this. So this is an example. Uh, Gn sub xn is uh, the value of the leftover inventory at the end. Okay, it's a, it's a problem that fits the classical form. You can take Gn equals to zero if you throw away the final inventory. So it's a classical example. Wk is a random variable. Okay, that's where the stochastic nature of the problem comes in. Uk has to obey some constraints. Uh, you cannot order negative inventory. It has to be zero or, or, or positive, okay? Sometimes there might be constraints that depend on the state. If your warehouse cannot hold more than 100 cars, then you can't order more than 100, right? Um, but, um, so here are some additional assumptions in this model. The probability distribution of WK does not depend on past values. You assume that demands are not correlated but they may depend on XK and UK. Um, you don't want dependence of the, of the uncertainty on the past because if there was such dependence, then it would provide information. Past, past demands would provide information about the current demand, and that could be exploited in, uh, in the optimization. So, so to make the formulation simpler, we assume that the current Ws do not depend on past Ws. Okay, now here's something that's very important for our subject. What do we optimize over? Do we optimize over sequences of orders of cars, or do we optimize over something more complex? Indeed, we optimize of, over something more complex called policies or feedback control laws, which are rules that tell us how much to order given the current value of inventory. So we optimize over functions, functions of the current state that tell us if you have 100 cars, order so much. If you have five cars, order so much. Clearly, it is important to adapt our decisions to the current information, to the current number that we have, to what has happened in the past. It would not be a good idea at the beginning of the horizon to make all our orders, all our decisions about orders, because it is clearly useful to take advantage of information, whether we sell a lot or we sell little, how much we have, and so on. So that's a major distinction we minimize over sequences of functions. 
mapping, each one mapping inventory to order. So our search space is over objects like this, a function of the initial inventory, then at time one, a function of the inventory at that time, x1, all the way to the end. Not over sequence of control, sequences of orders. So the search space is a lot more complicated than this. Okay. And that's why a lot of these other techniques, like linear programming, nonlinear programming techniques, do not really apply in their entirety. It's because we minimize over feedback laws. And clearly, there's a lot of benefit for doing that. If we restrict ourselves to optimize over sequences, we're clearly we're not going to do as well as if we exploit the information. OK. So now we are going to go back to the general case. Remember, our general problem involves a discrete time system with state control disturbance, an additive cost function. And now let's uh, look at a formal description. We have a system of this type. We have control constraints. At each time, we are restricted to choose constraint from some set that depends on the current state. We are given the probability distribution of W depending on x, k, and u, k. This is a conditional distribution. We consider policies. That is sequence of functions, each of these mu's mapping state to control. And these functions must satisfy this control constraint. And for any one of these policies, we formulate a cost that depends on the initial state x0 and on the policy. And it is the cost incurred if we use this policy. In other words, if we plug in the control that we will use at each one of these states, then this becomes a random number, which is averaged over all the w's, and give us this number. OK. So this is the cost associated with a policy starting at initial state x0. This is called the cost function of the policy. For every initial state, there's a value, OK? So we're dealing with a function. And the dynamic programming aims to compute the optimal uh, cost function given by this expression. So given this cost of policies, minimize overall policies to get j star. That's the optimal cost at state x0, starting from x0. It is a function of the initial state x0. OK, now here's something interesting. If you look at this expression, you would think that the policy depends on x0. There is no reason, superficially looking at this, why, if you plug in a different x0 here, you would use, that you would use the same policy. It turns out, however, that because we're dealing with functions, there exists, you typically, an optimal policy, pi star, which satisfies this equation for all x0. Pi star, the optimal policy, is independent of the initial state. This will come out as a consequence from the dynamic programming algorithm. OK, so this is a mathematical description of a generic finite horizon problem. Notice I've made no assumptions about the spaces where these x's, u's, and w's live. x may take values from a Euclidean space. Like, for example, if you have a car or an airplane moving in space, OK? Typically, the motion of this plane is defined by six state variables, OK? The positions, the three coordinates of the position, and the three coordinates of the velocity. So x is six numbers, OK, for such a, for, for, for such a motion. And x lives in six-dimensional space. 
okay, a continuous space. However, there are other problems where x lives in a much simpler space, like a discrete space, a finite space. Think, for example, of a queuing system. A queuing system where typically the state is the number of customers that are in the queue. Assuming that your queue has a finite number of spaces for customers, then you have a finite number of states. A very different, much simpler uh, space. You could have a network of queues, which is more complicated, multiple queues, and then it's a Cartesian product of finite sets, still a finite set. The nice thing about dynamic programming is that its theory does not depend on where the main variables live. Whether they live in a continuous space or a discrete space, the same reasoning, the same algorithms apply. Okay? That's a big thing because it makes the techniques the technique very general. Similarly, the control can be in a Euclidean space, can be in a finite set, like an on-off decision, uh, and the same thing with W. Okay, there's something called principle of optimality. People attribute to it magical, ma magical qualities. It lies indeed at the heart of a dynamic programming algorithm, but it's also a trivial statement a very, very simple statement, and it, it may surprise you that it is the foundation on which just about all of dynamic programming is, uh, is, is built. What is the principle of optimality? The name, by the way, is due to Bellman. Okay, principle of optimality is associated with Bellman. He was the one who, who, who put it forth and showed that it underlies many different models and algorithms, dynamic programming type. Okay, what's the principle of optimality? Remember that we are looking for an optimal policy. A policy is a sequence of functions. Suppose we have an optimal sequence of functions, which are called P star, pi star, okay? Now, let's, our problem starts at time zero and goes all the way to time n, right? A finite horizon. Suppose that I look at a sub-problem whereby I have arrived at some intermediate state xk at time k, and I look at the tail problem of how to go from xk to the end optimally, okay? So I have an optimal policy for the entire problem, and I also have formulated these tail subproblems, which involve the same system, the same control constraints, and so on. And we assume that we are at xk, at time k, and we wish to minimize the cost to go from here to the end. What is this cost to go? It is the sum of the stage cost starting at time k to the end and having also this terminal cost. So the total cost and the tail subproblems cost and the principle of optimality is the following rather obvious things. Think the tail policy, okay, this is the tail policy that starts from xk to the end. The tail portion of this optimal policy is also optimal for the tail subproblem. In other words, if I find myself at xk using this optimal policy and someone tells me, forget about the past, do optimally from here to the future, then I will continue to use the optimal policy. The tail portion of pi star is optimal for this problem. Now the idea is that dynamic programming solves simultaneously all the tail subproblems. Doesn't solve just the problem of going optimally from here to here, starting from a given initial state, but it also solves all the tail subproblems no matter what, where you may end up at any intermediate state xk, find an optimal policy for this tail subproblem. It solves all of them simultaneously, and all of them can be put together, their optimal policies, into a single big policy. How does it do that? At the generic step, it solves all the tail subproblems of given time length using the solution of the tail subproblems of shorter time length. Okay, it's a very simple idea. Let me explain it. 
We start over here, one step to the end. We solve this tail sub problem. Then we go to two steps from the end. And we solve this tail sub problem, but the solution simplifies because we have already solved the shorter tail sub problem. Then we go to three, three, um, three steps and uh, using the solution for the two steps. And keep going backwards until we get to the end. That's the dynamic programming algorithm. Is this principle of optimality here clear? Are there any questions that you might want to ask? Just to give one more example, suppose that I want to start and I want to go by car from my home, which is in Massachusetts in the United States. I want to go to California, the opposite coast, go to Los Angeles. And suppose that uh, I calculate the optimal route, the fastest route, and it goes through Chicago, OK? So I have this route. Suppose now that I fly to Chicago, and I want to find the shortest route by car from Chicago to Los Angeles. What would be the optimal route? Well, it would be the tail portion of the route that I would have taken had I started from Massachusetts shorter tail portions of routes are optimal, of optimal overall routes are optimal for the tail sub problems. Okay, so now let's give the dynamic programming algorithm. Let us Let us call jk of xk the optimal cost of the tail subproblem that starts at xk. Now we want to have an algorithm that gives this jk. And I start from this initial condition. At the very end, the last tail subproblem where I've landed at xk, this is the extent, there's no, nothing to optimize. This is the cost. And now we go backwards, one step at a time, having computed jk plus 1, the optimal cost of the tail subproblem starting at the next state, we add the cost of the additional of the current stage, and we minimize the sum of the two. So given all the jk plus 1s, I calculate all the jks. Given all the xn, I calculate jn minus 1 for every possible value of the state. Then jn minus 2, jn minus 3, all the way to 0. In other words, the interpretation, the word interpretation of this equation is to solve the tail subproblem at time k, I minimize the sum of the kth stage cost plus the optimal cost of the next tail problem starting from the next day at time k plus 1. Now, this is an algorithm that a computer can understand. You give it an initial function, this gn, and it cracks out. It has a black box that cracks out functions into functions. k plus 1 functions to k, and then to k minus 1, and so on, each time generating a function. OK, now I see what happened. I forgot an extra slide in here. OK, here we are. Here is the algorithm. To solve the tail subproblem at time k, we do this. And then at time 0, we have j0 sub x0 generate the last step. And it is equal to the optimal cost. Because the last tail problem is the original problem, so j0 of x0, as generated by this algorithm, is exactly j star. Also, if I record the minimum, the u that attains the minimum in each x, at each x, k, and k, I will obtain a sequence of functions of state where at xk, new case of xk minimizes in the right hand side this equation. So this algorithm simultaneously gives me the, the optimal cost of the tail subproblems 
and also an optimal policy by minimization in the right hand side. And actually the proof of this is very simple. Just by induction, you assume that this is JK plus one is the optimal cost of the case of problem. You prove the same property for JK. It's, it's, I'm not going to go into the proof of this, but you may be able to, just on the base of intuition, figure it out yourselves. And so also, of course, you can find the sources. So that's the algorithm. Are there any questions here? Yes. If we can this algorithm go forward, this uh, go backwards, can this go forward? OK, uh, the question is whether you can execute this algorithm going backwards going forward rather than backward. It turns out that you can execute it going forward, but only for a special class of problems. Problems where there is no uncertainty, where deterministic problems, where the w's take a single known value. Then you can sort of reverse the direction of time and, uh, and develop the, the, the same algorithm, but with time reversed, and it's a forward algorithm. However, there is no forward algorithm for stochastic problems. It's just not possible to do it. So, so, so the deterministic the problem, uh, the variables, uh, we, can, we can optimize the objective over functions or, or the variables. I, I don't know whether we can optimize over uh, a family of function or just the variable. Uh, to find, uh, perhaps you can, you can approximate this algorithm and do things in a different order, but to get the optimal solution, there's no alternative really to this. Yes? Um, so we talked something about the uh, Q-learning in the machine learning class, and we, we talked about the forward and backward algorithms. So I was actually wondering what exactly is the difference between the DP algorithm versus the uh, like, Q-learning and like, forward and backward. OK, um, you're taking me five lectures forward. <laughs> What's the difference between this algorithm and Q-learning? Uh, Q-learning is, uh, is an algorithm that uses uh, uh, sampling. Okay? Uh, it does not calculate expected values like here. Instead, it uses samples of W. So it's an algorithm that's, uh, that's more complicated, more general. Um, and uh, I think it ties in with, us, with the connection between dynamic programming and simulation. We're going to get into this in a fair amount of detail next week. So I'd rather wait until then. Okay. Yes? Uh, I'm not sure why it's not the optimal policy pi star is not it's independent of the Why is it pi star? Why is pi star independent? Well, because. You're solving all the tail subproblems in this way, and it comes out to be the, what you get is something that works for every initial state. It's the nature of the algorithm that. Um, it is for, okay, so this is optimal for the entire thing is optimal for any initial state and every tail portion is also optimal for the tail uh, problems okay just that because the dynamic programming needs to find the optimal policy of all the tail sub problems at a given stage so at the end it also solves all the all the all the original problems from any initial state yes so around here you mean you minimize the how about other types of our function? For example, the 95% pile codes. I'm sorry, we are far away and I can't figure out. I can't, I can't make. So, around here, you minimize the expected value. How about other types of function? Other types of cost function. OK, so the question is that here we have a problem defined as, as an expected cost problem. It's possible to have a different kind of problem, like a max, the maximum over some of over the Ws, where W is given by some kind of set description, or W may be chosen by an antagonistic opponent. Uh, 
There is a dynamic programming algorithm for such problems as well, and the rationale is similar, and I'm going to touch upon it a little later, uh, but for, sim for, for simplicity and specificity, in this course I'm going to focus on expected values. However, they, there, are, there are generalizations, uh, uh, certainly. Yes? Uh, as you define the problem goes to the very end of the whole problem, shall we, shall we change it and solve uh, like uh, a small k less than the big n? That means when we define a tail problem, the beginning throughout the middle, but uh, the end with uh, not the square like uh, define a problem of smaller horizon, you mean, and consider yes. that? Well, we, we do that, basically, right? We look at all the problems of smaller horizon um, in the process, okay? Jn minus 1 is obtained here, and so on. Jk is obtained here. So we solve all the intermediate problems with this algorithm. Okay, I'd like to take a, a break. I think two hours is too much for, for me and I'm sure for you. <laughs> and uh, uh, so what I'd like to do is uh, every 35 minutes or so, give or take five, 10 minutes, take a break for 10 minutes and then you have a chance to digest, formulate questions and rest a little bit and I have the same. So let's break and get back in exactly 10 minutes, please. Thank you.